um, wanted to add to what Pascaline said in the beginning that all the uh, buildings at Monash are empty because all the students are in Europe. That's not true because we are from European universities and we are here within the same program. So we actually fill the buildings in um, for the students that are in Europe. So that's why I'm uh, from Charles University of Prague as well. And um, from Monash EU Center. Um, what, um, what we prepared for this presentation um, is um, a few slides on transformation from uh, the communist regimes in Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe to the situation that we have today. You can see that the map is different, but the map is not everything. So we will uh, go a little bit into what, what happened between uh, basically 1980s, which is what you see on the red dish map, and, what, and, and, and today, which is the blue map uh, that is on the right. Um, Eva already told you what um, what um, communism was, or where it came from, from Marx and, and then uh, Lenin and Stalin, and you all know these things. Um, however, um, it is important to say that uh, in the second half of the 20th century, uh, there were different types of communist regimes in Eastern Europe. Um, there were the countries which were worse off, uh, in my mind, and they were really part of the Soviet Union. Uh, that was the Baltic states, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. And that was Belarusia and Ukraine uh, and Moldova. So they were really part of the Soviet Union, uh, which was a different situation uh, than our situation, which was uh, uh, the state of uh, East Germany, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, and of course Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, which were independent formally, but they were so-called satellites of, of the Soviet Union. Uh, and then there were countries uh, such as well, Yugoslavia and Albania, uh, which although they were communists, they were not um, uh, you couldn't call them satellites of the Soviet Union because they had their own uh, policies and, and their own mind, you could say. Um, so that's just to illustrate what, illustrate what, um, what I want to talk about because this should be about Central Europe, which uh, is sometimes difficult to define. But for today, let's define it as, um, as the four Central European um, communist countries, which by today I think it's actually five of them. So it's East Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, which means Czechoslovakia and Slovakia today, and uh, Hungary. Um, you might argue that also Austria and Slovenia are part of Central Europe, and, and Bavaria probably as well, but that's just um, for, for the purpose of transformation, we stick to the, the communist countries. Uh, the transformation process was really difficult and the main reason was that communism took place in all parts of the society. Um, in politics, of course, there was one party rule, that was the, the communist party of each of the respective countries, but they were all directed from Moscow, from the Soviet Communist Party. Um, there was no division of power, no pluralism, no NGOs, uh, nothing like that. No basic freedoms, no free media. Um, nothing you take for granted today. Um, <coughs> economy was completely different from uh, Western liberal capitalism. It was all centrally planned. There was no private uh, ownership, although in some countries such as, such, such as Hungary it was possible to have a, a small store, kind of. But for example in Czechoslovakia there was no private ownership at all. Uh, and that was the case also for agriculture, so it was all collective uh, farms uh, with no private ownership whatsoever. Uh, and then it was also the society. Um, as I said, there were no NGOs, there were no real trade unions, there were trade unions of course, but they were again part of the governing regime, so the trade unions couldn't, couldn't do what they normally would do, that's protect the workers, because they were actually part of the government. Uh, and. Um, no real professional organizations, nothing like that. Uh, what's the result of, of such a situation? Well, uh, the, the results were not very nice in either of the, 
of the three um, areas. Um, I just have some um, some pictures. You you just you uh, um, a, a while ago you saw a picture of uh, Stalin, and you know the pictures of Lenin of these strong leaders. <coughs> um, what happened after 40 years of no political pluralism? Um, there's these guys who were the last leaders of Central European countries. They were <coughs> other strong leaders were get, uh, getting really really old. Um, and maybe the, the, the Bulgarian one is a great example, Toto Shivko, who was in power for almost 15 years. And, uh, and then you got these apparatchiks, these people who were faceless bureaucrats, who somehow made it to the top. And the best example is our very own uh, Czechoslovak um, leader of the Communist Party, the last one, Miloš Jakeš, uh, who was actually so stupid and so funny that um, people uh, were copying his speech that he delivered on a Communist Party Congress in 1988. Uh, he delivered this speech, but it was so stupid that the Communists made it a, a, a state secret, and the people were secretly copying this speech and distributing it among each other as a, as a samizdat thing, as, a, as, a, as an opposition material, actually. So uh, that, was, uh, that was the um, unhappy end of uh, communist leadership. Um, so that was that was the, the, the political result, I would, I would say, that in the 80s you could see how the regimes were, um, how, how, badly, how, how, how bad they were doing, actually. Um, although they were capable of, um, of sustaining all the uprisings that took place, but it was always with the help of Soviet, um, Soviet troops uh, in 1956 and Hungary in 1968 in Czechoslovakia. And then in Poland, the, 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 the Soviet troops finally didn't have to come, but they were ready to come. They were all, all, all around the, uh, the Polish borders, ready to go in 1981. They finally uh, didn't have to go. Um, and 1989 was the first time when there was no Russian troops ready to, or Soviet troops ready to, uh, to invade the uh, Central European countries when this uh, public uprising took place. But there were other results as well in, in uh, economy, which um, is sometimes presented as something that the communist, communists didn't really do so bad in, like that there was some economic progress, some people might say. Uh, but I have a, I have a um, nice example of, um, for example, Czech uh, automotive industry, uh, or Czechoslovak in Czechoslovakia, um, uh, we in, in the 20s and 30s we were on the top of automotive industry and uh, the people from uh, Germany, from BMW, uh, they actually visited uh, one of the top car makers in Europe, which was in Prague, um, and they came there to learn how to make cars. However, they, this company that they went to was called Praga, and I believe no one ever heard about this company here. Have you heard about the cars named Praga? No, no, and you never will because the communists destroyed it. So that's just an extreme example, but they, they destroyed most of the uh, industry that existed in Central Europe before, and especially the parts of Central Europe that, uh, uh, that were developed, which was uh, large parts of Poland, uh, Hungary, um, Czechoslovakia, um, the, 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 the economy didn't really do well during these 40 years. Um, then you might know that there's a lot of uh, pictures of queues in communist countries. Um, I noticed actually that the Australians like queuing too, especially in front of restaurants and bars, uh, which <laughs> we don't do to okay. such an extent in Europe. Um, but these were different queues, and they took longer. And um, you, you know these pictures from the 50s, which is kind of understandable, because it was after World War II. But these two photos are from the 80s. Uh, this is from Poland and this is from Romania. This is this is a queue for just normal grocery store, just to enter it. And this queue from Romania is for cooking oil because they just brought cooking oil to the shop. Uh, we have these queues mostly for bananas and oranges and and these things that have to be imported. So in Czechoslovakia, uh, we didn't have in the 80s we didn't have queues for completely basic stuff, but we have queues for fruits and vegetables. Uh, so in the 80s, 
you saw these politicians, you see the economy is not doing well, um, you can see that the, the society is frustrated. Uh, that's when I, when I asked my mom what was the strongest feeling in the 80s, when she was in the 70s, when she was a young woman growing up in, in Slovakia. Um, she said it was frustration because she, and depression because she could, everything was great and she couldn't do anything to, um, to be inventive, but she, she just had to be in the brain main street. She couldn't really uh, travel, she couldn't write a book because she's a writer. Uh, she, she couldn't do anything like that. So um, the society was frustrated, the economy was not doing well, uh, the politicians were kind of grey as well, as you saw. Uh, so um, you saw Mikhail Gorbachev coming to the scene with his um, openness, restructuring and democratization, which indeed went, just went to um, the fall of Berlin Wall and to um, to the fall of the other um, Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern European regimes uh, as well. Uh, there was not much violence that is interesting compared to some other revolutionary years that we've seen since. Uh, but uh, that's also not uh, true in general. For example, in Romania, uh, there was a lot of violence uh, during the revolution uh, going on. So what we needed to do after the um, after the revolution, we needed to change everything. You saw that there was a um, there was a need of political, economic, legal transition and transformation. You needed to um, to do something with the with the top communist leaders, with the top secret police leaders. Uh, you needed to um, to return uh, the the stuff that was stolen from the people in 1950s. Uh, so there was a lot of a lot of things to do, and and what what most of the leaders of the opposition wanted to do was to make it peaceful, or which was basically successful, except for Yugoslavia. But that was not because of the war was not caused by restitution; because it was caused by like, nationalism. So that was another rising uh, issue in Central Europe after the fall of communism. Uh, and what uh, some writers say that. Uh, what is the most difficult thing is to change the minds and hearts of the people. Uh, because after 40 years you had uh, basically two generations that never lived in a free society. Um, and their <coughs> code of conduct, the, the values they had, were completely different from what you would set as important values today here or in the West. Uh, so changing these, these mindsets was, was a big challenge and it's still a problem. Kind of, um, and not just with the older generation, but, but even with young people who sometimes, uh, instead of uh, getting the, the, the new good liberal values, they just learn the bad stuff from, uh, from, the, uh, from the first generation of, uh, uh, of um, after revolutionary businessmen and politicians. Um, so in politics it was quite easy. You organized free elections. Um, and um, in all the countries, uh, normal parties formed from left to right. Uh, I think that that was the, uh, one of the easiest things. Uh, although you needed to transform the institutional framework to create the, the new parliaments and the, uh, the new government ministries and all the institutions. But, but it was, this was not as difficult as, again, changing the mindsets to rule of law and human rights and stuff because you still had the uh, you, had, you still had the, the old legislation in place of course so this had to be changed so then uh, privatization uh, that's a wonderful issue and an example that I will present in a minute and um, as I said changing the society was really difficult because for example um, when everything was collectively owned uh, there was a saying that uh, not stealing from this collective property is stealing from your family. So it was a basic thing that you would steal in the company, where, in the state company where you work. Because if you didn't do that, that was something strange. And you would, by that, you would be stealing from the family. These are just the basic values of, of private property and ownership that, that just needed to be changed. Uh, 
and then there were these um, questions of um, rehabilitation illustration, which is a process where you don't let the top secret police and top communist officers get places in uh, top government positions in, in the new government. So everyone needs to have a uh, have a paper saying that he was not one of the top secret police and communist officers. And restitution, again, restitution was a problem because if they took a farm from you in 1949 and they didn't invest anything and they gave it back to you in 1990, you could imagine how the farm looked like. So that was another uh, problem. So there, there was a lot of owners, thanks to restitution, but they didn't have the capital to actually renovate the stuff and, and invest in it. So that was another challenge. And then most of the um, uh, public, uh, companies were privatized and the, the Czechoslovak way was uh, extremely interesting and uh, 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 kind of unsuccessful. Um, they actually privatized it through coupons. So each of the citizens got coupons to buy a share in public companies. Um, but what happened? Uh, they privatized, then the new management, uh, they instead, instead of running the business and investing in it, they actually stripped the assets and they let the empty company go bankrupt, which meant uh, unemployment and, uh, of course, lower GDP. Uh, which again led to mass delusion instead of, um, instead of uh, um, the, the, the happy times that we were hoping for on demonstrating on the stretch of the flight. So uh, that's, that's basically how the, the mass privatization didn't work and, and, um, and this caused a lot of, a lot of bad mood uh, among the, the people and a lot of nostalgia also. Um, I just wanted to show you this graph which shows that um, this is from 1950 because you can't read it, I just till 2002 uh, and there's just the gap in GDP that you can see in 1990 because the heavy industry uh, was stopped almost immediately because it was not competitive and uh, it, uh, it was um, producing a lot of um, uh, stuff that was not needed anymore, such as tanks and, uh, and stuff. So, so that's the gap in GDP, but then it started growing much quicker uh, in the 90s. So although the privatization was not all the way successful, um, the new free market really did the work itself and then uh, the GDP started growing really fast in all of these countries and um, this was basically uh, the challenges that I was talking about but because we're okay <laughs> because of the EU I just wanted to yeah this is just interesting that um, that the communists still exist but I wanted to talk about the EU in the last two minutes I had um, and that is what the EU did for the transformation uh, because it was a two-way process. Um, the EU actually um, helped us by the way that we had to harmonize um, our legislation with the European Union. Um, in that way, we didn't have to uh, figure out everything from scratch. We had some um, ideas from Brussels. Uh, but at the same time, um, in the 90s, there was no, well, the European Union uh, dates back to 1993, so uh, there was European community before. They, they didn't really uh, know what to do with us because it was all uh, so sudden and no one expected the fall of the <coughs> regime so quickly. So uh, we had to transform anyway uh, in the 90s and the harmonization of the legislation with the EU came uh, as a help during this time. And there was also these annual reports by the EU about the progress uh, that each country is doing towards joining the EU in all the aspects, society, politics, and economy. Uh, and that was very helpful because if you have a deadline every year and you need to make some progress, then it really helps the politicians to deliver because otherwise there would be the negative annual report by the EU and the government would uh, have trouble in the media. So, so that was very helpful. Uh, but at the same time, um, the country joined all the other important um, international organizations such as NATO and OECD uh, and they also became an important bloc within the EU so not just the requirements that the EU imposed on us 
in order to join. Uh, but also the Eastern European or Central European countries um, created a bloc which is called the Visegrad Four, which is Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. Uh, and if you see it, it's, it's actually bigger than Germany in this bloc. So it's quite important in the EU, and we try to coordinate our policies. I hope uh, the ambassador would agree, uh, although it's not easy always. But we try to coordinate our policies within the EU in order to um, to actually play an important role also towards the EU. So it's not just taking uh, the taking everything from the EU, but also uh, trying to change it uh, towards the way we think. Uh, so this is this is just a quick um, conclusion, and I'm sure I just ran out of my time. So these are just uh, just the main challenges that we faced. I'm sure you get the presentation um, and all the slides, so you can read it later. But it's the challenges I was talking about. Uh, My subject is, is, of course, how Russia deals with Europe. There's an old Chinese saying that the best approach to any target is to circle from afar. I'm going to start a long way off. Little luck, I'll get there. When Vladimir Putin first met Angela Merkel, he had a brief, he's always well briefed, that she disliked dogs. She came into his formal room in his residence outside Moscow, and within seconds, his favorite Labrador, Connie, Connie, came in and nuzzled Mrs. Merkel's knee. That's number one. Number two, last year, about March, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov came to Australia. He was en route to the South Pacific, and um, the then Australian Prime Minister Kevin, Australian Foreign Minister Kevin Rudd had a formal dinner for him in the Sydney Opera House. 20 or 30 guests. Beforehand, there was, uh, in proper diplomatic practice, a coup de champagne. Mr. Rudd, Mr. Lavrov, Mr. Lavrov is out, offered a glass of champagne. Kevin Rudd takes a glass of champagne. Lavrov says, would prefer whiskey. So the waiter is about to go and Rudd puts his champagne glass back and says, I think I'll have a whiskey too. <laughs> when he goes out, he comes back, two glasses of whiskey on the rocks. Lavrov says, without ice. And Rudd says, I think I'll have a <laughs> So the waiter goes out again, comes back, whiskey without ice. And Lavrov says, I like soda water with my whiskey. And Rudd says, I right, I'll have soda water. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> and finally, that's, that's an anecdote for you. The Russian style of diplomacy. And I, even though I have a very high regard for Kevin Rudd as a prime minister and as a diplomat, the way he fell into that crude trap and finally, this is a conversation. Tasmania, yes, I have been there. My new friend was a slightly inebriated middle-aged man called Igor, who had insisted I join him and his pal, Boris, at their table in the cozy cabin bar on the fourth floor of the hotel, the only floor with plenty of hot water. I am ethnologist, he said. So I have seen all those pygmies and crocodiles of yours in Tasmania. <laughs> Very interesting. 
is already a very Russian sort of conversation. What do you do? I'm a writer. Uh, do you have any great writers in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, without wanting to be too postmodern about what great means, yeah, well, we have um, Patrick White, for instance. I thought of mentioning Helen Garner, but decided against it under the surface. I have never heard of him, said Igor quaffing an alarming amount of vodka from his glass in one gulp. Have you, Barry? Boris hasn't heard of white either. You see, the trouble with your country <laughs> is there are no great Australians. Can you name one great Australians? <laughs> Don Bradman, I can do. <laughs> Nor would Kylie Minogue. <laughs> Well, I began hoping some suitable name would pop into my head, but strangely enough, my mind was a blank. <laughs> Surely someone in our history had been great. In the Russia, we have lots of great writers, great poets, great scientists, and great ethnologists. My grandfather was a prince, by the way. Do you have princes? <laughs> well, no. Not as such, I said. Sh should I mention our Mary in <laughs> This used to be a great country, Igor went on, with Maurice nodding sagely on the sidelines. A very great and mighty country. And now it is all in ruins. <clears throat> now I have to get a visa to visit my own brother in Kiev. <laughs> At this point, he fell sound asleep. He slumped sideways at a dangerous angle in his chair. But he has pulled him upright, murmuring tenderly in his ear. The most powerful nation on earth! <laughs> Igor said suddenly, returning <clears throat> with a burst of lucidity to the fray. You cannot say that about us, <laughs> No, you can't, I agreed. But, but do you think you're happier now? Before. before the collapse? No. What I said to feel happy about. We were great, we were powerful. Now I have to get visa to visit my own brother in Kiev. <laughs> so I wanted to start with that because what we're dealing with here today is, is the Russian approach to international relations. And if you ask Russians to try to sum up their own country in one word, you'll get various responses. A common one is feudal. Uh, another is the Russian word krainosti, which means taking everything to extremes. But the most common one in my experience is the word Lilikaya. Russia is a great country. It's not an ordinary country. It can't be measured by ordinary measurements. <coughs> what does greatness consist in? How would you define greatness? Well, Russians would say that they are a great power. And here we come back to the very interesting question of the language, because in Russian, the word for great power is Vidika Dzirzhava. And Dzirzhava is a word which comes from the verb to seize. Dzirzhivo. Seize it. A great power is a power which has the ability to seize other countries and to hold them. Dirzhat, that's what it means. So there's that notion of a great power. And in the Russian mind, I would submit to you, there are two types of countries. There are great countries, and there are the rest. There's an old Irish folk song that says, it was England bade our wild geese go, that small nations might be free. The notion that small nations have a right to freedom clashes with the Russian notion which says that great powers have a right to influence the countries around them to, to secure their own legitimate security. 
There's an old Russian saying that says, the only secure border has Russian soldiers on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> Many Russians today feel the loss of empire very sorely, as I think the British probably did in their time, and other imperial peoples. Many find it very hard to accept that the Soviet Union fell apart, not because of some CIA plot, but because of its own internal contradictions, which I think were set out for us very well just now. Someone is to blame, and it ain't us. This notion of great powers is, I think, crucial in understanding Russian foreign policy to anyone, to the United States, to China, to India, or to Europe. Um, second point, we had a very good introduction this morning to who is Vladimir Putin. Well, Vladimir Putin is many things. I think he's a formidable fellow. I think he's a very talented fellow. I don't like to sound patronizing. Um, there was only one factual error that I could see in Teresa's terrific presentation, and that had him KGB officer from 1992. He was KGB officer from the 1970s. It was what they call a walk-in. On three occasions, Vladimir Putin tried to join the KGB. On two occasions, he was told, we don't take walk-ins. But in the end, he joined the KGB. And he became a formidable martial artist. And he was well trained in mind control and in memory. He's got a photographic memory. And he's very good at dealing with people. He can change. And the way he charmed George Bush was a bit like Lavrov and Kevin Rudd. When he met George Bush, he was wearing crucifix. And George says, I see you're wearing a crucifix there, Vladimir. He said, yes, I want to tell you a story about that. Many years ago, I had a small dacha outside Leningrad. And it caught fire. I was able to save. My wife was away at the time. My two daughters were there. I saved them. The following morning, I looked in the ruins, and there I found this crucifix, which belonged to my mother. And I've worn it ever since. And George Bush came away from that meeting saying, I've looked him in the eye and seen his soul. <laughs> oh, give me a break. Um, so Mr. Putin is a KGB officer. Very important to understand the different distinction between the KGB, the CIA, and say Asia or ASIS. The KGB is a military organization. You are a KGB officer. You have a right to bear arms. And when Putin met the now Chancellor of the ANU, Gareth Evans, in 1992, and Evans said to him, what's your background, Mr. Putin? He said, I'm a military man. And Gareth said to him, would you mind telling me what branch of the military? I'm not at liberty to say, he said. But the point about the military is this. Any one of you, any of you who have dealt with the Department of Defense will know and as the Polish ambassador was saying, there's something about the military mindset. And one of the things about the military mindset is there's a technical solution to any problem. The diplomat will tell you very often there's no technical solution. The only solution, the technical solution, of course, includes war. And the diplomat will tell you, no, we need a negotiated solution. Traditionally, Russia as an imperial power has placed great emphasis on military might. Even today, they have a million strong army. Russia has conscription. You might say, be well, so does Finland, and so does Switzerland, but I don't think the Baltic states are terribly worried about the Finns. Um, nor are their neighbors very worried about the Swiss. But you have history teachers that you have a right, if you're the Estonians, to be concerned about them. And you have a right to join NATO. If I were Estonian, I would have been bashing on the door to get into NATO. To this day, Russia has 184,000 internal army just to keep the peace. So the Czechist military view, the KGB view, the Russian view is you have to be strong. Because if you're not strong, you'll get beaten. Someone will oppress you. 
And what really matters in this world is there's three great powers. And Russia should be one of them. US, China, and Russia. And Mr. Putin came to power with the promise that he would restore Russia to greatness. But this <coughs> of course, he has kept his promise. You don't need friends. Alexander III once famously said, Russia doesn't need friends when it has its army and its navy. And Putin loves to quote Palmerston from the fact that countries have no permanent friends, only permanent interests. That really appeals to him. So it's against, really, that background that we look at how Russia deals with Europe. The Russian, one of the speakers today mentioned the Westphalian notion of diplomacy. One of these notions of 19th century diplomacy was that <coughs> countries had legitimate spheres of interest. And Mr. Medvedev, when he was president, said that Russia has a sphere of privileged interest. What this really means is that Russia has a legitimate right to influence the policies of the countries on its periphery if those policies impinge on Russian interests. And this is where you come up against a fundamental values clash between Russia on the one hand and Europe on the other. Russia stands for sovereignty of a great state and the right to, let's not say interfere, to influence the policies of the states around it, be it Georgia or Moldova or perhaps Poland or Kazakhstan. Obviously, with the Chinese, they're a bit too big to push around, so we'll leave them aside. Um, and the European Union, of course, stands for groups of countries coming together, small countries, banding together to seek non-violent diplomatic solutions. If you look at Russian policy, you'll find that generally, unlike a small country like Australia, relatively small, they don't even really give a tinker's curse about multilateral organizations. The G20, you know, the East Asia Summit. Too many countries, and they've all got the same power. An effective multilateral organization has a small number of countries, countries that can actually achieve something. Not bootling little countries that chatter on about their rights. That's why Mr. Putin doesn't like to go to these meetings. He considers them a waste of time. So I would say to you that the core instincts of this man and the group of people around him, the number two man in Russia, Mr. Sechin, he's effectively number two, served with the Russian military intelligence in Angola. He actually had a, a military role. He fought in the civil war in Angola. Uh, he's also a very talented, very effective man, but he shares with Putin this view that ultimately power comes from the barrel of a gun or from a Swiss bank account, and they would agree with Stalin. Very quotable, Mr. Stalin, who famously said, how many divisions has the world? You could argue that's an outmoded notion of power, but that's a notion they have. So I would say their core instincts are primacy of hard power, strong sense of exceptionalism, an essential of a sense of strategic entitlement. Well, that essentially brings us to Europe. For Moscow, Europe is really a set of small countries in decline. Whereas Moscow has said that the, the wind of geopolitics is back in Russia's sails. And they have reason to think that way because Russia has between 6 and 25% of the globe's resources of almost everything. The exceptions of bauxite, rare earths, and uranium. They've got the rest. And if you know that fossil fuels are going to drive the world economy for some decades yet, and you're sitting on them, and the, big, the biggest international companies like ExxonMobil have to come to you to do a deal, then I think you've got a right to feel fairly confident that Russia may have its problems. But by comparison to, say, Europe, we're doing pretty well, thank you. It's quite clear when you look at Russian policy, they don't like to deal with Brussels. Better to divide and conquer. Pick the individual countries and try, them, try to induce them by whatever means to 
do what you want them to do. So in the case of Germany, clearly the most important country in Europe, you buy Mr. Schröder, the former chancellor, and you make him the head of a new company which will build an oil pipeline through the Baltic, which will mean you'll be able to export your oil directly to Germany, your biggest market, avoiding Ukraine <coughs> and Poland and not having to pay, thank you, not having to pay any royalty. From Russia, from Moscow's viewpoint, if you think about it, that makes good sense. You don't want your strategic assets going through countries like Ukraine and Poland that may get beyond your control. Better to have a direct line through the Baltic to Germany. Russia also makes, takes a focus on France and plays very, very well to French notions of French glory. And of course, have just had a very significant victory by persuading Mr. Depardieu to come and be the Minister of Culture of Mordovia, which is a province famous for its gulags. That's what you've got. <laughs> Lots of gulags. So he's done very well there. That's a terrific coup, I would have thought. Fundamental problem is the values gap. The EU, as we've heard today, stands for certain values. Russia does not stand for those values. Russia stands for other values. It's not my job to say which set of values is more valid. But that they are different, you can be absolutely sure, and you saw it very graphically in the case of the Pussy Riot affair, where most Russians thought they got off lightly. Yeah. Most Russians believed they should have been punished much more severely than they were, whereas the bulk of Western public opinion was horrifying. Come on, they went to a church for 30 or 40 seconds and staged, come on. Anyway, only 6% of Russians attend church. Attend. So it seemed to me that encapsulated the difficulties of this relationship. And looking down the track, I think one can't be too optimistic about relations between Russia and Europe because of that values gap. It may change over time. As you know, most Russians, in fact, prefer to have their holidays in Europe and to have their children educated in Europe, and to have their money in a Swiss bank account, or English bank account, anywhere but in Russia. Because in Russia, the Kremlin can come along and take it. So I'm not optimistic about those futures, and I think probably the most likely scenario of relations between Europe and Russia is sort of a mutually assured stagnation, because of the value gap. They'll continue to trade. <coughs> But if you actually look at the figures, the trade is nowhere near as substantial as you might expect. Energy will, of course, continue to be absolutely crucial. Um, I think that's the last of the points I wanted to make to you. Oh, yeah, just one final one. <coughs> and that's this notion of Russian exceptionalism, that we're different. We're not Europe, we're not Asia, we're Russia. And we are different. And there's a very famous quote, which I have here somewhere, from the Russian writer Gogol, where he actually, and the Russians love this quote. No, brothers, to love as the Russian soul can love. To love with all one's mind and all one's body, with everything that God gave us, no. No one else can love like that. Only we Russians have that passion. <laughs> There's another saying that goes with it. The Germans make good suitcases. <laughs> and the gist is here that there's much to admire in Germany, much to emulate in Germany, obviously. But ultimately, the Germans are a banal, earthbound, while we Russians, we aim for the heavens. So thank you, Pio. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, both presenters again for a uh, very interesting and stimulating uh, thoughts that they've shared with us. Questions, comments? Uh, where's my partners? Oh, there they are. Uh, I've got one for each, actually. Um, um, basically, uh, so this with um, especially just the last half of what you were talking about there uh, with the current um, 
current situation and stagnation. Can you uh, provide a list of um, resources or, or books that, that are possibly out there to, uh, to read, look at for that information? Uh, basically, right from back, you know, say from, um, yeah, I just found it fascinating and also very positive but also very scary as well. Um, but I'm just talking about because when I did say earlier on that I believe that Russia what is, in, is integral to the peace of the Middle East, um, but, but basically um, what you've been saying for the last 10 minutes, very fascinating. Uh, I'd just like to um, know where to, to get some of those resources from to read about that. Um, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, but there was a lot of, there's also, I don't know, I'm still processing it, so a lot of the things that, that, that were said... Well, I wouldn't want to sound too negative. Um, but it was good. As the Russians would say, but things could be a lot worse. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Someone has pointed out that in, in Russian terms, Mr. Putin is almost a liberal. In Russian terms. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and some of the people around him, like the ex-ambassador to NATO in Brussels, Mr. Ragozin, who's now the defense minister, he's really scared. Yeah. Because he's completely cynical and ambitious. So but things could be far worse in Russia, and I happen to agree with you on the Middle East. The Russians like to say, it's some of an exaggeration, that no global problem can be solved without them. Well, very often they actually don't want to take part. No. Once they've got a seat at the head table, sometimes they don't even turn up. Um, because they're in the club. But um, I think in the case of the Middle East, uh, Russian involvement, I think it's recognized Russian involvement is crucial. I actually brought along a list of books. I was thinking I was going to be speaking to secondary school teachers. I wasn't quite sure where to pitch the remarks. Um, but I brought along a list, which I'll leave with Bridget, Thank you. of books I think are good reading, you know, and well worth reading. And I later thought, how anti-dilubian of me, I haven't given you websites when I gave you books. Mm -hmm. And um, the, if I had to recommend one website on Russia, it would be Der Spiegel. Oh, really? Yeah. Why is they've that? Got, they've got an excellent English a website. Yeah. And I think, because you see, the Germans have a very nuanced policy towards Russia. Because of their, the historic legacy of their relations with Russia, the Germans contort themselves to be fair to the Russians. The United States sees no reason to be fair to the Russians. Certainly the British see no reason to be fair to the Russians. Um, and the Russians would complain to you bitterly that they get a very biased, unbalanced, prejudiced press in the West. Well, you can't say that about their Spiegel. Um, so I was thinking if I could recommend only one site to someone who wants to cover what's happening in Russia and get thoughtful, reflective commentary, which is actually trying very hard to be fair to the Russians, then I can only agree. The, the Guardian is very good. The, 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 the English Guardian is very good. Um, and the Spiegel is, is, is really excellent. But I'll leave the list of books good. with um, Bridget and ask her to copy them for everyone. And just on a secondary one, but with the uh, rug, the, the, the deals with the uh, I, mean, I haven't dealt with many Russians, but the way, uh, but what I have learned with dealing with, with, with Russians and, and for respect and things like that, that what Rudd did, and, and I won't go on to about Rudd, but wouldn't that, that, that transaction, that there, that, with that, that person, that was the, that politician, uh, would look on him as being lower than a, like, lower than a dog, basically. Oh, I don't think so. Um, I suspect, you know, Lavrov is a real professional. Um, but, but that's what I'm saying, is, is that he's to been, bring a person down to there, I would say... But he walked him. Yeah, he outsmarted him. Oh, it was a brilliant move. Powerage it was an absolutely change. brilliant move. But there would be no way to counteract that. Yeah, I, I, I just, I, I don't know Lavrov personally. I've followed his career 